you so much for being here. Thank you so much to my two esteemed guests. Uh, just in the way of a brief introduction, Eno Ebong is the director of the U.S. Trade and Development Agency. Samaila Zubairu is the president and CEO of the African Finance Corporation. Please join me in welcoming them. Thank you. So we are here to talk about strategies to bridge the continent's infrastructure gap and to unlock its potential. This is a phrase we hear a lot. I just want to start with how you look at that phrase. I know, kick us off here. What does it mean to you when you talk about unlocking the potential of the continent? Well, thank you so much. And can I just say, it's fantastic to be here. I love the energy in this room. I love the diversity in this room. I am excited, as you can tell. <laughs> um, but just to, to bring it right back to the question, it's interesting. I think I feel a little bit conflicted about unlock. Clearly, the potential is there. We know it, we see it, we feel it. And for those of us who are working uh, in the continent from there, experience it every day. But it is true. There is a gap, uh, particularly in financing, for the innovative projects, transactions, activities that can close the infrastructure gap. So I think of the need to attract financing, and in particular, I think about it in the focus we must face, really, in building and developing projects that can be financed. So US Trade and Development Agency is an infrastructure-focused agency, and we're focused on supporting that development of infrastructure projects, defining them at the early stages where the risk is high, um, but where the possibility is, and bringing financiers to it. It needs partnership, which is why I'm really happy to be here with Samaila and it means being creative about unlocking the financing, maybe not so much the potential, but we can debate that. We'll go into more detail on that, but Sumaila, what about you? How do you look at that phrase? So thank you for being here, and good morning to you all. So um, for us, we don't have time to discuss the African potential, so I'm gonna try and keep it brief. So the way to look at Africa is that we have the youngest population in the world, so that means a growing market, a growing middle class. We also have significant natural resources. We also have significant energy renewable sources on the continent. And I'll try to use an example of a case of how Africa is re really pivotal to net zero and how Africa can work for itself and the rest of the world. So we are currently engaged on a transaction as lead developer for Lobito Rail. Um, and that's a rail line between Zambia to Angola, um, and then from Angola to the port of Lobito. Uh, we're the lead developers on that stretch, and we're also financial advisors on the main Lobito line from DRC to the port of Lobito. Mm -hmm. Now, that is the copper belt. That is also significant forest cover for carbon credits and carbon markets. That is also significant agricultural potential, you know, because Africa has 60% of the world's uncultivated arable land. Um, and we also have over, I would say, 39% of the world's minerals that are required for the energy transition. We also have um, 10,000 gigawatts of solar potential 110 gigawatts of wind potential, 350 gigawatts of hydro potential, 15 gigawatts of geothermal potential, and 400 gigawatts of thermal gas potential. So we are currently embarking on decarbonizing a mining operation that is going to produce green copper. And we're doing that because we've expanded you know, the capacity of uh, a mine from about 900,000 tons to over a million tons. Mm -hmm. And we've expanded the capacity to process the copper ores to concentrates. And we're building a smelter that will further transform that to copper anode. Why is this important? Because this is an example of how we can all work towards a viable energy transition. Mm -hmm. So in this operation, we've reactivated one of the Inga dams. So we're going to use hydropower to process 
the uh, ores and the smelter, and that will reduce the amount of shipment from Africa to Asia, you know, for processing. So most times when you see a ship of ores, it could be 50 to 70% of it is just waste. When you process in Africa at the source of the resource, you can capture and retain more value, create more jobs for this amazing population that I talked about, and also reduce the emissions that come from the shipping journeys. So when you focus on the African potential, mm -hmm. it means looking at how to get the resource that we have, work better for Africa and the rest of the world. The energy potential is a huge part of this, specifically on the infrastructure part, which we're talking about both physical and digital infrastructure here. Uh, and let me put this question to you because there was a recent estimate by the African Development Bank that the continent faces an annual infrastructure financing gap of $100 billion a year. Just put that into context for us. Does, does any other region or continent face that kind of gap? And what does that mean for the scale and the type of projects that aren't being built? I think it's a really important question. I think it's the largest gap that we see um, in the world. Um, so the focus does have to be laser. Um, what it means is that there are many projects that do need to be scaled. I think that the um, point that I started with in terms of project preparation is key to that, but even that has to be scaled. To start a project, it's an extremely expensive and risky proposition. Um, lots of challenges, even before a shovel is put into the ground where developers are spending millions of dollars. It is hard when you're starting to find that capital. So agencies like ours provide grant funds to be able to kickstart that effort, but it needs to be scaled. Um, it, it absolutely does, um, and you need to bring in partners along the way to do that. Not just project partners, that is key. Industry, government, private sector, both on the continent and in the United States. But you also need to bring in strategic um, partners. And for us, even though we're in at the early stages, this means financiers. So we work very hard to partner with six of the continent's major financiers, AFC is amongst them, and I'll just preview that there'll be a, a hint of another partnership that we're going to uh, uh, celebrate later on this afternoon. If you're not doing anything at 4 p.m. at the lot, please come and, and join us. Um, but that kind of partnership is critical because you have to bring the financing, and the way to do that is to accelerate the project pipeline so that your partners are aware of what you're doing, you know what their interests are, and you can develop projects that are well-suited, both in energy um, and in digital, which are huge parts of our portfolio as well. I'll just say you can't drop a hint like that and not expect a journalist to follow up. So what, <laughs> what more can you tell us well, about what this partnership might look like? Actually, um, Samila uh, hinted at it also in describing uh, mm -hmm. the work that's being done very, very, um, I, I think to the great benefit of all the stakeholders that he mentioned along the Lobita corridor. Mm -hmm. uh, so absolutely related to that, I can say no more. You have to come and join us. <laughs> the tease if ever there was one. So Violet, talk a little bit more about this, the public-private partnership uh, part of this. How, how crucial is that to making it work? And sometimes the concern is that, well, there's a dissemination of responsibility. No one really takes the lead. In the end, it's the people on the ground who need the benefit of these investments and projects. How do you look at, at the collaboration between public and private entities? So I mean, most infrastructure projects are public-private partnerships. And what is key is the risk allocation between the public and the private. There has to be an understanding that the public is supposed to provide certain goods, and if they cannot, they need to de-risk and enhance for the private sector to come. And what that typically means is you just need to honor the contract. You know, if we've agreed that this is going to be done, it needs to be done. And we need consistency in the framework for how things get done. Our approach has always been we need to find the reasons to get things done and we're focused on how they get done. So at AFC from inception, we're focused on project development, which is what she referred to, 
as the key to unlocking the infrastructure uh, opportunities that are on the continent because the need doesn't really translate into a project. So we have to work together and we've kind of assembled a team that allows us to develop to the risk opportunities and the examples. So for example, the um, government of uh, Djibouti wanted to be 100% reliant on renewable energy. We had a partnership with them. Um, we um, built the, the, the development team. We de-risked the project. We invited um, FMO, which is the Devel Dutch Development Finance Agency, Climate Investor One as well. And we put in place a construction uh, finance instrument to build a plant. Uh, we commissioned the plant last year, and they have um, over 16 megawatts of electricity. Mm -hmm. um, and they are meeting, sorry, they meet, they have 60% of their energy requirements, and we're expanding that. So what is important is through innovative financing and through early stage risking capital, you're able to deliver a project at scale, even through the COVID uh, pandemic. And that's what an is, example. If I may, what does innovative financing look like? So it means um, focusing on outcomes, um, focusing on the parties that you're going to work with, and you know, adapting the instruments to the requirements of the project. Yeah. So, I mean, it will be the same debt or equity, but you will introduce certain conditions to it that makes it more user-friendly. So that is really what we do. And because Africa doesn't have much capital, we need to find ways to first leverage the capital that is on the continent mm -hmm. and then attract capital externally. I want to kind of focus on how we get more capital on the continent. So what is important is that we need to understand that Africa needs to own its development and it needs to finance its development. And we have to do that by working with the savings that we have. We have to work with our domestic savings. We need to find ways to capitalize our banks, capitalize our multilateral development banks, and find ways to unlock you know, um, savings from the pension funds to invest in infrastructure mm -hmm. and in industry. We that have a project called the Infra Credit in Nigeria, mm -hmm. where we've um, de-risk for pension funds and insurance companies. And we think that can be replicated at scale. So we need to first own the development. We are the ones that will develop our continent. We have to use our own local resources to develop our continent, and we need to find ways to get it done. Let me bring so Anna in on I did. I just yeah. wanted to give an example on the other end. It's a scale, but smaller scale, of a Nigerian company called Hotspot. And this will show all of, I think, what Somalia are talking about, um, that a USTDA feasibility study helped to power its mobile communication bases um, with solar power. And this is a completely homegrown um, project idea. Hotspots are a Nigerian company. And they were able to um, co-finance with um, InfraCredit, infra um, which, which helped along with the blended uh, climate finance facility of UK's FCDO, Foreign Commerce Department. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that the project was done with Naira denominated debt mm -hmm. issuance. And that is, that's what's innovative, right? You know, it's a little bit of uh, necessity being the mother of invention. You know, foreign dollars are not accessible, but the creativity is there along with partners to come up with a strategy using local currency um, and the support of the partners then meant that nine institutional Nigerian investors then uh, contrib contributed to this project. So already, 100,000 people are in experiencing increased connectivity using solar power. So I think that it underscores at both ends of the scale, large and small, there is creativity on the continent. What is needed is an ecosystem of partners. And I would venture to say another element that is critical is, is communicating this and getting the word out and changing the narrative a little bit to, to the fact that, oh, what's going on? Nothing's going on. There is a lot going on. And, and it's a very healthy ecosystem that we can all participate in. So Milo, we have 30 seconds left. I'll give you the last word on what you hope people in the room take away from this conversation. Again, it's, we have to own our development, and we need to um, finance it. You know, we just need to own our development. We need to take responsibility for the future of Africa, future generations of Africa. 
and make sure that we're focused on good outcomes for them. Clearly, we need a lot more time to talk about this. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Please join me in thanking our guests.